Fire Church, I just wanted to say uh, good morning, good evening, whenever you're watching this, and uh, we just are excited to worship with you today. Um, so let's just pray, and then we will get into our worship this whenever you're watching it. Um, dear Lord, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for um, just the beautiful weather that we've been having, and um, just time outside, and all of the beautiful gifts that come this summer. Um, and Lord, I just pray for us now as we um, would just quiet our hearts from anything that might be distracting us, um, that we would just take this time and truly worship you. Lord, I just pray that we would lay all of our anxieties and fears and worries and cares and doubts um, at your feet and that we would just um, praise you and celebrate you um, today. Uh, whatever time of day it is that we may be watching this. So, Lord, we just thank you for how good that you are to us and that your promises never fail. Um, I just pray that we would remember that and that we would look to you. Um, so we love you. Amen. <laughs> our sin white as snow, for washing us white as snow, for 
covering us in your righteousness, for even making it possible for us to pray. God, we wouldn't be able to do it without you, Lord. I thank you for your son and the sacrifice of Jesus. God, I thank you that your work in our life doesn't just stop at the cross. It continues to circle back to the cross. Um, Lord, all the way through our life, you continue to pursue us. You continue to bring us back into your goodness through our life over and over and over again. Lord, when we continue to run off, you continue to bring us back because you are faithful to do that. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for being good to us. We thank you and we praise you for being good to people who don't deserve your goodness. It's in your name that we pray all of these things. Amen. church uh, and anybody else that might be listening to this broadcast certainly love to have you along um, you know the last few weeks we've been looking at some some different things and some of the challenges about you know living in proximity to one another and helping each other in our growth and helping each other um, you know whether it's through small groups or through one-on-ones or through having a relationship but but really I, I came back down to the very basic most fundamental element of all of it in that being God. Uh, I mean, the fact that, that there are things in the scriptures and you look at people in the scriptures and go, 
how did they have what they had? And to think of the, the intimacy and the proximity and the relationship and the conversation and the engagement with God that they had. And, and, and the fact is, God calls every one of us into that same type of thing. Now, you know, there are people like Moses as an example. I mean, Moses, the friend of God, he's called. Uh, and, and we could certainly say, well, we can see why Moses had that type of relationship with God. He went up on the mountain, on Mount Moriah. He, he, saw the, uh, uh, he saw this incredible burning bush that was not consumed and realized he was talking with God and he was told to take off his sandals because the place he was standing was holy ground. And then we saw all the miracles and the things that God did through Moses. We can say, well, certainly because, because Moses had that encounter, that's why he had that unique relationship with God. Well, there are other people in the scriptures that maybe didn't have that same type of experience. Two come to mind. I'll talk about one. Uh, save another for another one for another time. Uh, one is Job. Job had an incredible encounter with God in, in, in kind of a backward kind of way where everything was taken away from him. And yet he said, even though I've lost everything, yet I will praise God. Yet I will bless God. So Job didn't have this great experience that Moses had, but yet in his character, in his person, he passed the test and continued to bless God even though he lost everything, even his own health. Well, then there's David. He's the one that I kind of want to camp on today because, you know, he is called what? A man after God's own heart. Now, you might be saying, I'm not a man, I'm a woman. Okay, be a person after God's own heart. And and from what we know, David didn't have like this mountaintop Moses experience uh, that, that Moses had. Uh, we read about him being a shepherd boy out, playing his lyre, playing his whatever musical instruments he played, tending to the sheep, moving the sheep around in different pastures. And yet we see him perhaps thinking about God in the midst of all that. For whatever reason, David lived in a place in his life, even, even as imperfect as he ended up being, he was one of these, those people that, that God said, here's a person after my own heart. He was one of those people that would say words like these. And these are the words I kind of have gotten wrapped up in and trying to understand. A word like Psalm 37 says this in verse 4. Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, uh, I like a different rendering of that. The one that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not, not just take delight like I'm taking delight in a, in a blizzard from uh, Dairy Queen or something like that. Have you seen the lines? That's incredible. People really like their ice cream. I mean, he's not talking about just that type of delight. Take delight. That's why I, I like the rendering better that says, delight yourself. May yourself, may your being itself take delight in the Lord. And so oftentimes what we do is we, we, we will look at that verse and say we want to have delight in the Lord so we can have our stuff. We want to have delight in the Lord so that he will give us the desires of our heart. If we're really honest with ourselves, very often we are still consumed with what we're going to get out of this deal. That's, that's, that's what grips us. Well, if I delight in God... But if we're still gripped by the other things, are we really truly delighting in God? And so uh, I've been thinking about what it means to delight in God. I, I've been thinking about Psalm 1 where it says delight, uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord. That, that word delight. Well, here in Psalm 37 where it says take delight in the Lord, this word delight actually means to make yourself pliable. It's really what it means to put yourself in God's hands and make yourself like silly putty, to make yourself like clay, to make yourself just God, here I am. And that's what this word translated from the Hebrew actually means, is to be pliable in the hands of God. There is a, a, a foremost thinker and speaker in our day, older pastor, uh, who is yet riveting to young people, and his name is John Piper. And John Piper is known to say words like these, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And to think about that, and, and I speak frequently about, you know, glorify, this is the Father's glory that you bear much fruit, 
But Piper goes further than the fruit. Piper goes to the root. Piper goes to the, the very heart of the matter in, in us being satisfied in God. You know, it, what happens to us so oftentimes in our Christianity is that we make this, this satisfaction um, satisfaction around a theological construct, around a concept of, uh, of God and, and understanding theologically who God is. But God is not merely a theological construct. God, first and foremost, is a person. He is a living being. Before there was anything, there was God. God was before time. God was before space. God was. God is. God is being. John chapter 4 tells us this, that, that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is. God is a person. And so we, we think of him being this person and not just this construct, and so we are invited to be in a place of delighting in a person, delighting in God. To think of spending a time with a good friend, yet where you've maybe gone out for dinner, when we could do those types of things, uh, or gone for a walk somewhere and poured out your heart and you reconnected and, and, and just it was so good, so satisfying to be with that person in that moment. That's the exact imagery of being satisfied in God, to be in that place in a relationship where you just don't want to leave because it's so good for us to live there. There are other passages that speak to this idea of, of being satisfied in God, satisfied in the person of God, satisfied in his spirit, being alive in him, walking with him, knowing him. For instance, in Philippians 4, 4, it says to rejoice where? It doesn't say rejoice in your circumstance. It doesn't say to rejoice in, in um the fact that everything is going good. It isn't saying to rejoice in your stuff. Rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 32, be glad in the Lord. Psalm 16, in your presence is joy. And he also says in Psalm 16, the Lord is my portion. And I've thought about that over the years. What does that mean? I mean, portion, uh, uh, the idea of our inheritance, the idea of what we're going to get in the end. I mean, are we really looking for the inheritance of heaven or are we looking forward to the inheritance of the presence of God? God, you are my portion. I long for you. Psalm 42 says this, As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul after God. This is the idea of being satisfied in God. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about what is this idea of being satisfied in God? What is this idea of, of glorifying God in this way? What is this idea of delighting in God? Next week, we'll talk about why delight in God, and there's so many reasons why we can delight in God. And then the next week, we're going to talk about how. And, and that might mean some changes for some of us, but God is worth these things. To think about the deer panting, is that me? When I think of the greatness of God, and I think of the glory of God, and I think of the magnificence of God, and I think of what God has done in my life, even before I had Christ, the fact that God gives me breath of breath, the fact that God gives me life of life, to be in a place where I would be saying, God, I'm panting after you. I am desiring you. We get so busy chasing and doing and working and pursuing. And no wonder why it says in Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. That we would know him. Psalm 143. Psalm 142. I cannot read my own writing. Let me get there real fast. And I will tell you what this says. He speaks about this in Psalm 142. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice. I pour out my complaining before him. I cry to the Lord. You are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. Psalm 142 verse 5. He speaks of this idea of God being his portion. He speaks of in verse 9 of Psalm 143 of hiding myself in you. 
This type of relationship with, with a real God, longing after this God, following after this God. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 11. Another passage that speaks about relationship with God. The God of heaven. The God, the maker and sustainer of all things. He says not only this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Our boasting in God, our rejoicing in God because of the reconciliation that he brings to us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us that Christ suffered not to get us to heaven. That's not what it says. Let me read the words to you. 1 Peter chapter 3. Hold on. Pages are not turning as I want them to turn. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us the fact that Christ died. Christ not only died, but Christ suffered. It says these words. It says, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And it doesn't say to bring you to heaven. It doesn't say to bring you to church. It doesn't say to give you a better life. It says Christ suffered. The beating he endured, the, the, the crown of thorns that he wore upon his brow, the, the, the beatings and the bleeding that he did, Christ suffered to bring us to God, to relationship with God. So it isn't about just the working and the serving and the doing and the duty. It's, it, it's the idea of the loving because of who God is. It's the idea of like, if you bring your flowers, if you bring flowers to your wife and say, well, I, it's, it's my duty. I mean, is she going to receive that very well? But if you say, hey, I'm bringing flowers because I love you, because we belong together, that's, that's another uh, level of, of demonstration. Yeah, we can read things in the book that tell us what we should do to be good husbands or good wives, but, but it's when we really love that person that, that we act those things out because we're driven by love. We're not, we're not acting to love, we're acting because of love and our love for God. How do we get to know God? We get to know God, I mean, we've talked about this before, we get to know God through his creation. First and foremost, his creation points out the reality of God. And, and if you're a person that does not know God yet, I encourage you, just walk outside, whether it's it's during the night on a, on a starlit night, lie down on, your, on the ground and look up at the stars and think about the stars being where they are, think about the planets all being where they are, held in their orbits perfectly, not colliding with each other in and have wonder about the greatness of God. You can look at the flowers of the field. You can look at the, uh, the majesty of the mountains. You can hear the, the pounding waves of the ocean. You can see all the different types of species of animal that there are. You can think of the complexity of the human body and, 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 and what it takes for it to function and realize that God made all of that. And then to realize that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to be the demonstration of us uh, to us of his own reality, of his own person, of his own love, of his own character. And this Jesus died to, to fix the relationship that was broken between God and between man. But we have a response we need to give, and that is a response of faith, a response of trust, of trusting in Jesus Christ, of acknowledging what Jesus Christ did, how he suffered, First Peter 3.18, to bring us to God. If you have not yet come to God through Jesus Christ, I encourage you today to come to God through Jesus Christ. Now, maybe others of you who are listening, you prayed a prayer at Vacation Bible School or at a, at a Good News Club or, or Sunday School or church service or Christian camp or something else. God isn't calling us to go to church. God is calling us to be in love with himself. Going to church hopefully inflames that and, and, and stirs that and, and fans the flame of that. But we're not called just to go to church. We're, we're, we're not called just to have devotions. We're not called just, just, just to get to heaven. We're called to know the God of all creation. 
to think about God being infinitely all satisfying. Think about a nice smoked brisket. I love these food illustrations. You all know that. Juicy, done just perfectly. Think about cutting into that. Oh, it's close to lunchtime when we're recording this. Mm. And just think of the delight, the, the, the pleasure of eating that. Or, or think about uh, the pleasure of uh, some new thing. Uh, my wife and I just got a brand new 2014 Jeep Grand Cherokee with less than 100,000 miles on it. Uh, it's a beautiful cherry red color, metallic red, and you know, I could go out there and, and, and polish that and wax it and shine it because it looks so nice. It's, you know, it's brand new 2014. This is 2020, if you haven't noticed. Take pleasure in things. We take pleasure in our spouse. We take pleasure in our kids. We can take pleasure in a vehicle. We can take pleasure in, in, in a painting that we have made. We can take pleasure in a brisket that we, have, that we have smoked. But the question I have is, do we take the same pleasure in God? See, all those things I just talked about are gifts from God, things that he has given to us for, for our enjoyment. And it's not wrong for us to enjoy those things, but to allow those things then to take us to the worship of God. The worship of God who gave us the taste buds to be able to taste the brisket. I'm salivating here. Do we worship the gift or do we worship the gift giver? To worship the gift giver. And what we find pleasure is what we treasure is another line that, that Piper often uses. What do, we, what, what do we treasure? Do we treasure God in that way? Our, our highest aspiration should be not, not just our own physical health and well-being. Our highest aspiration shouldn't be our, just a, a bank account and ability to retire. Our highest aspiration being the aspiration to love and enjoy God. That's why he made us. And when we live in the enjoyment of God, it doesn't matter what happens in life. It doesn't matter what happens with, with, with the coronavirus. It doesn't matter what happens with the economy because we're living in a place with God where we know that God is in charge and God is in care. And in fact, there, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that speaks of how the, the Corinthians gave out of poverty and out of severe affliction with abundant joy that overflowed into the generosity of others because they were in love with God. This, this joy that they had in God, this abundant joy they had in God, even in the midst of poverty, even in the midst of affliction, overflowed to others. And we can be the same way. Peter tells us to be prepared to answer anyone who asks us for the reason of the hope that we have. When we're loving God, when we're living in the enjoyment of God, even in the midst of difficult times, people are going to say, what, what is it about you? Why do you have this hope? It's because we've learned to enjoy God. The greatest reality in the universe, second greatest reality in the universe, apart from God himself, is his glory. His glory is consuming. His glory is magnificent. His glory is unending. And, and we're called to, to, to apprehend. We're called to chase after, to pursue God in his glory, to know God in his glory. So I ask you today, do you think about these words? Do you think about delighting in God and what it means? This is what it is. It's delighting in God. It's being satisfied in God. It's rejoicing in God. It's being glad in God. It's making God our portion. It's making God the one we hunger and thirst after. I pray that that will be us. Church, let, let's, let's stir each other up into that most holy pursuit, our highest calling, our greatest duty, the, the, the highest aspiration of life is to live in that type of relationship with God. May we help each other toward that end. This week, what is desiring God? What is delighting in God? Next week, we're going to look at why. 
What has he done for us that we would even want to delight in him in that kind of way? Well, let me pray for you. Lord, I pray that you would be at work in, in each one of us, stirring within us a, a holy passion for, the, for delighting in God, delighting in your presence, delighting in your person, delighting in being engaged with you, that we won't settle just for theological concepts, that we won't settle just for theological constructs, that we won't settle just for black and white words, but we want to have the reality of biblical truth lived out in the experience with a living God. So Lord, would you move in our hearts. For anybody that doesn't know Christ, I pray that you'll help them today to give their life to Jesus Christ, to trust in you, to follow you, to know your forgiveness, to know your grace, to know your love. And Lord, may you stir within the rest of us a holy passion after you. Lord, would you be most glorified in us as we seek to find satisfaction in you. For the glory of Jesus and the good of your people, I pray. Amen. Well, good seeing you, and uh, we'll see you next time.